All right, everybody. Welcome to a very, very special episode. I've been trying to get Tone on the BitVault podcast for quite a while now. We're recording at block height 700,634. And as everyone can see, if you're watching the video version of this, which I'm going to have to upload because Tone has such a beautiful, beautiful background, Tone is recording live from Malta. What's up, Tone? Welcome to the podcast. Hey, man. Happy to be on. It's, uh, uh, Bitcoin's a crazy world. And uh, yeah, you and I crossed paths uh, about a year ago, uh, finally in person. So it's uh, your journey's been incredible, man. Huge popularity now. Did you, did yeah, you ever yeah. think you'd get there, like, do this in your life? No, and I, I, it's it's absolutely crazy. I, I wrote about it in uh, Citadel Twenty One, and you know the name of the article was "Bitcoin Gave Me Purpose Again," right? Um, and and I could tell tone just you know you could tell when people go through their own trials and tribulations, right? And uh, you know Bitcoin gave me hope and it gave me purpose, right? Uh, gave me a way out of of the rut that I was in. So, so yeah, and, and you know what's funny is that I, I keep hearing that same story over and over again, the story of hope um, that Bitcoin gives everybody. But enough about me. I want to hear about you, Tom. <laughs> and, and I think that um, a lot of people, you know, they, they see your, your phenomenal YouTube show, which but definitely you guys should definitely go. Um, Tone is very rare in the sense that he doesn't talk about shit coins. He talks specifically about Bitcoin. Um, and the Bitcoin price action, and and he's actually surprisingly very accurate sometimes. Um, one of the things that completely just blew my mind, right, is back in January, Tone made a call essentially. And again, guys, I'm not a big fan of TA, right? I'm a I'm a dollar cost average guy, but this just blew my mind. I'm like, this guy's the real deal. Essentially, it was back in January, and Tone said. Yeah, I think the Bitcoin price is going to go, you know, it's going to go, uh, it's going to pump to maybe 50, 60 K and then it's going to dump back down again. And then towards the end of the year, it's going to go to a hundred K and, and it looks so far that that's exactly what it's doing. And I remember tone that I asked you when we were at your buddy's house, we were playing to poker. You invited me to play poker and I'm like, tone, how do you know that? And you're like, it was a gut feeling, right? So where did you get that gut feeling? How did you develop it? Um, and how the hell did you make that call? You know, that that was impressive. Not going to lie. And I, and I know that you got a lot of heat for it as well, you know, for making that call. I was like, no, it's just going to keep on going up. But you stuck to your guns. What was that about? Yeah, because markets tend to move in similar fashion, but they're never identical to what it was like previously. You never get the same bubble. You never get the same, um, you know, like we had the dot-com bubble and then we had the real estate bubble and everyone was waiting what was going to be the next bubble. And uh, here is the next one. The next one has basically been crypto, but the world of crypto moves so fast uh, up and down that we've already had several bubbles. And the current environment between economic, global economics, and global politics uh, after what's been happening in 2020 reminded me a lot about global politics in 2013, 14, and 15, where Europe was going through issues and there was the Cyprus money confiscation back in April, uh, March, April of 2013. And then there was a lot of regulatory chatter about Bitcoin in November of 2013, right after the Silk Road shutdown took place uh, back in uh, October 1st. Like I remember all these dates and what Bitcoin did exactly because I've been doing these Bitcoin TA videos almost every day for what feels like five years now. It might have actually been five years uh, since I've been doing this every day. And it's a very similar environment where there is a lot of government overreach. There is a lot of government concern over what people are doing with their money. And I very clearly remember the price action of Bitcoin in 2013. Now, 2013 was probably the greatest year for Bitcoin besides the very early days where the price of Bitcoin went from about $10 all the way up to $1,000. 
Now, every time Bitcoin rises, it's harder to make it rise faster. This is why in percentage terms, we're never like 2013 did not do what it did in 2011. And in 2017, it did not do what it did in 2013. And here in 2021, it's probably not going to match percentage terms of even 2017, where it went from uh, about 1,000 to 20,000, which is a 20 times movement. But in 2013, it went from $10 to $1,000, which is 100 times movement. So this time around, I was thinking, okay, maybe it'll be half as uh, high in percentage terms as 2017. The year started at approximately 10,000. So the end of the year, you know, 10, 10x in one year is a very good bullish year. And it's half the size of the prior year, which was about a third of the size of the prior bull cycle, not prior year or prior bull cycle. And now uh, we have to consider what kind of a bull run it's going to be. And it just felt more like the 2013 type of bull run with two peaks instead of a straight single bull run of a single peak like what happened in 2017. And just based on those numbers, the first peak made sense to be between 50 and I initially set around between 45 and say 60. We made it to 65. I raised my target a little bit at that time, uh, but it was the same vicinity. And we pulled back. I didn't think we would pull back lower than 20. We pulled back to about 28. Uh, I was thinking 25 at the time. We bounced a little bit earlier. And now it's time to break that 100K either by end of year or very early next year. Man, in incredibly bullish. Um, I, it, it, I think a lot of us have the same sentiment, right? Which is, you know, Bitcoin follows the halvings, right? But at the same time, it's exactly what you said. You know, it's it's uh, you know the law of big mon big numbers, right? It's it's much harder for something to go from you know uh, fifty thousand to two hundred thousand. That's one hundred and fifty thousand in between, right? Than something to go from ten dollars to a hundred dollars, right? Right. So um, so yeah, I completely agree with that. But tone, I know that you know people use you all the time for for your uh, you know for your TA, right? Um, and I kind of want to focus this episode. I want to take a a little bit of a different approach on who is Tone Vase. So Tone, what is your background, right? Um, and why have you decided to take this this uh, this no bad lifestyle? What has led you to this, right? <laughs> what what work experiences made you feel like, wow, I have to break free. I have to, you know, uh, be in a different city every you know every other week. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, this will be actually a really long story, but I'll try to keep it short. So I was born in the Soviet Union back in the communist country. And uh, my family immigrated to America when I was approximately 10 years old, uh, around that time. And the, you, you know, it was still USSR at the time that I left. Uh, so my Russian passport was surrendered. Uh, I would like to get it back now, but it's impossible once you surrender a passport of a country, you can't really get it back. So uh, those that surrender the US passports, you know, you can't get that back anymore. You get one shot at this. And um, uh, like reflecting on that has been interesting now that I'm at an older age. So going through an American schools, uh, I actually, you know, uh, became a bit of a liberal. I mean, that's what they teach you in college. And I uh, spent seven years in universities. I have three degrees. I started out as a high school science teacher, uh, then moved on to be an adjunct professor uh, teaching math, some math programming. Uh, my degrees are in financial engineering as well. Eventually, I made it to Wall Street, worked on Wall Street building risk models for about 10 years. But trading was always fascinating. So right out of college uh, in the early 2000s a friend of mine convinced me hey tone let's go take a trading course similar to the trading courses that i teach today uh, so i teach a couple of courses today one of them is basic technical analysis 
I also teach risk management, which they never taught me. I had to learn that one on my own by losing a bunch of money first. And then I also teach an options course. Uh, and back in the day, this education cost me $8,000 plus travel expenses because they took place in different states than I was living. And I didn't have that much money. So I basically spent all my money learning how to trade. And then the problem was, where do you find the money to trade? So of course I had to find jobs and I had to trade on the side. When I finally had the Wall Street job, I was able to make some money. And then I, it's very hard to trade while also having a day job. Very, very, very challenging. And uh, when I first got that Wall Street job, I was happy. I increased my salary from teaching. I instantly doubled my salary overnight. And then after 10 years of Wall Street, you know, that salary was nice. It was, uh, you know, getting up there close to $200,000 a year. If you are a good, if you are a good worker and you know what you're doing and you get bonuses. So I was making good money. I started doing a bunch of investments and I just got tired of going to work and sitting in an office and that trading bug was always there. Uh, but it's scary. How do you quit a job like that? And suddenly you go from no, from a, a $160,000, $170,000 income a year to no income a year. And your job has the potential to lose you a bunch of money with trading and uh but i wanted that lifestyle you know i i hated the lifestyle of going to the office it's just it, 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 i got really tired of it so um i started discovering bitcoin around 2013 with the cyprus banking confiscation now, let me back up a little bit um it was around um so after i voted for barack obama for presidency and watching the first couple of years of his presidency, uh, that's when I finally realized that my parents were right. And what my parents always said from the day they arrived in America in the early 1990s, uh, up through when they became citizens five years later and had the ability to vote, is that Every Democrat is a closet communist. Uh, that's what my that was my dad's uh, that was my dad's view on politics. Now you yourself, you're Latin American, right? You're dude. I I came from Venezuela. So yeah, there you go. When I see the Democratic <laughs> Party, you know what I see is not closet. I see full on Marxist. You know, they, they, don't, <laughs> they don't even hide it anymore. And you know, and I'm right. the cra I'm the crazy guy because you know right. my American friends look at me like, right? What are you talking about? And I'm and then like I'm especially the election man. And I'm looking at them and I and I got chills the night of the election because I saw. What I yeah. saw in Venezuela, right, which is just yeah. the right, let, let's just call it what it is, the all right theft, okay, just boom, yeah. right, yep. and and it's like Americans are just, they they have, an, they have this attitude where it's like it's never happened here, so it could happen here, right, but that's because they don't understand communists, these people yes. are amoral and they only care about power, okay, so I'm sorry, yeah. Toad, continue, no, no, I, I just, no, 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 you know, no, 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 when we get into not. that, I yeah. get spicy about it. Yeah, you no, know, no, no. So. I know we should we should do a whole political uh, podcast. So I'm going to keep the politics to a minimum. But politics had a lot to do with my journey into Bitcoin because um, after voting, uh, you know, liberal uh, for Obama, and uh, even before that, uh, I realized that was a huge mistake uh, because I saw Obama. Obama's policies were the complete opposite of his platform that he ran on. Uh, look, Trump might not have achieved what he wanted, but he certainly didn't do the opposite. But we're witnessing people do the opposite. We're witnessing it now in Canada, where if you look at, you know, five-year-old videos of Trudeau, he's talking about how it's your body and, uh, you know, like, like all this stuff. And that was the opposite. And Obama ran a platform to end government spying and he did nothing but increase it. So it was uh, just, just the complete opposite. You know, like uh, Biden uh, in debates from last year talking about how he would never mandate vaccines and here we are, right? So uh, anyway, so that journey, Ian, after voting for Obama in 2008, 
and realizing that what is going on, uh, going into the 2012 election, I started becoming a lot more libertarian and watching like the Ron Paul campaign uh, when Ron Paul was running for president. And if you look back at those debates from 2011, they are incredible. Everything he said, he was absolutely right. And in order to follow the Ron Paul campaign, in order to follow the Ron Paul campaign, uh, I had to watch it on alternative media, which was mostly Al Jazeera and Russia Today, RT. So I was watching about America in America from the Russian channel, the former Soviet uh, USSR country that I escaped. It is uh, absolutely incredible, right? Because you were, I was actually getting an unbiased view of America by watching it from Russia Today. And that's when I found Max Kaiser and some of the other financial channels. And it was Max Kaiser that introduced me to Bitcoin as far back as 2011, where Bitcoin was $1. But I didn't take Bitcoin seriously until 2013 when I watched the banking confiscation. And I was becoming a lot more, you know, gloom and doom and the dollar is going to collapse. And uh, what is going on with the stock market? And, you know, like listening to all of the gloom and doomers like the Peter Schiff's, like uh, I can name them all day. You know, I've seen them all. Peter Schiff, Mark Faber, uh, Gerald, Gerald Salente. And um, I, I grew myself out of it since then. But uh, at the time, it was interesting. And anyway, that, that's my that's how I discovered Bitcoin. And in 2013, I realized that Bitcoin is the first unconfiscatable asset humans have ever owned. And looking back at my family leaving Russia, even though I was young, almost 10, uh, when we left, my family was only allowed to leave with 100 US dollars worth of money per family member. And all the other wealth you had was basically confiscated by that government. You were not allowed to leave. And hearing back the stories that my mom was saying, like my parents were not crazy materialistic, uh, like having a lot of jewelry and all this stuff. <clears throat> and when you're defecting Russia, you basically go like through the airport and then there's this like, and then there's like, you know, some government official, this lady, and she's like looking through all your stuff. And then like, she was like angry that my mom didn't have a lot of jewelry because they were like, no, 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 you can't take this. You can't take this. It's like, yeah, like they confiscate the very last, piece of your wealth uh you know and like and literally she's like, like looked at like my the, the things my family had when we were leaving and she was like is that and my mom was happy that like her family ring was not taken off her finger and then she's like is that all the jewelry you have and my mom was like yeah that's all we have and she was like angry she's like okay get the hell out of here you know like wow we can't confiscate anything from you and um and this is the power of Bitcoin. This is the true power of Bitcoin. And it was really awesome that I was able to secure unconfiscatable.com because it was not, it's still not a real word in the dictionary. And now that we have the unconfiscatable conference, which I know you'll be at in Vegas next time. Um, Absolutely. It, um, uh, Max Kaiser loves to use that word. We've become friends since then. Uh, that was my journey into Bitcoin. But my journey into Bitcoin was just a backup plan for my actual freedom path, which was a trader of the traditional stock market. So when I was ready to quit my job in 2015, and it was the worst time to quit based on the price of Bitcoin. And um, I had a bunch of backup plans. I always like backup plans. I'm pretty risk averse. That's probably why I worked in risk. And uh, okay, so I started a physical business in New Jersey. Uh, that didn't work out very well, sucked a lot of my money, which is why I didn't end up with you know, enough Bitcoin as I should have. I also uh, started investing in some crypto companies in 2015, also a terrible idea, pretty much lost me uh, all those investments. Um, I also quit my job to be a trader. And then I started writing articles for Cointelegraph and I started doing videos and I started public speaking. Because one of the reasons why I wanted to quit my job is to have freedom. I wanted to have, you know, the dream that you see me right now of sitting on some beach, you know, with my laptop, 
trading and making money. In reality, when you become a trader, you're sitting in a basement with six monitors, uh, stressing like hell. So the early days of a trader, while I was making money, it was not uh, very mentally enjoyable. Uh, it comes over time, and I would have gotten there. But as my physical business wasn't doing very well and I wasn't enjoying it, and my investment, my attempt to be a VC with the money that I saved from Wall Street uh, was not working out very well either. Uh, my trading was keeping me afloat and making me enough money to live on. Uh, but the most enjoyable part was starting to travel. Outside of my journey from Russia to America when I was way underage at 10 years old, and that journey was to Austria and Italy, uh, the only countries I've been to were Canada. The only country I've been to was Canada until the age of about 27. Um, I don't know if you want to give away your age, but I'm guessing you're in your late 20s. Yes, I'm 29. Right. 29. So yeah. how many countries have you been to uh, at this by now? Um, so uh, I'll put it to you this way, Tone. Just a um, number. Uh, just a number. Okay, I've been to basically every country except Australia. What do you mean every country? I've been to literally like India, Pakistan. Um, oh, yeah, all of uh, Wow, the made the Nepal, major Ch China, Japan, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Zambia, um, wow. uh, Morocco, Egypt. So, we're, so, you, so you've been to like close to a hundred countries by now. Yes, but but again, that's I, so I was fortunate enough tone where you know my story is a little bit different than yours. I grew up with a lot of wealth, right? Um, oh. My my father, my father, my mother, we lost it all during the two thousand eight financial crisis, and you know I think my when my father left us, he left us about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in debt. You know that I found Bitcoin about a year later. And I built everything back up again, right? But wow. when I was at a young age, right, um, I was very fortunate enough, right, to be able to visit many locations and uh, get to know the world. And I'm sure you know this because you've been traveling like crazy, Tone, that once you travel to different places and you meet different cultures, you understand the world much better oh, yeah. than if you did not, right? So, um so yeah, man. So my story's a little bit different, right? Um, but here's yeah, the thing, I grew up right? Very poor. Yeah. But here's the thing, Tone, right? And the, the, there's a there's a huge difference because so you grew up very poor, and then you've built yourself up, right, with hard work, perseverance, yeah. right, and experience. Yeah, my, yeah, my right? first job was at thirteen, uh, though there was also a job when I was ten in Italy. It's a crazy story. I was lived for four to six months in Italy at ten years old wasn't going to school. So I was basically hustling on street corners with a squeegee washing car windows at 10, running into the middle of traffic at red lights, like you see in you know some Latin American countries as well. Of course. Um, and I know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, that was me. And, <laughs> man, listen, you, I, I always respect the hustle out of anyone. And, you know, you people got to do what you got to do, man. But look, I, I had a, the total opposite. You know, my first car going out of high, high school was a Maserati. Right. Like literally, like wow. I was living in, you know, such a goddamn bubble. Right. Um, and then 2008 happened. Right. Um, and essentially my my dad's company went bankrupt and, you know, my dad literally disappeared. He left my mom with one hundred twenty thousand dollars in debt, wow. you know, um, and that completely changed my life. You know, um, it got to the point where I, I was literally living on my friend's couch. I had, you know, less than $10,000 to my name. And then um, it the, the point that I was trying to make tone is that it's much harder to go from having everything to losing everything than to going back up again. Because psychologically, Right. And I'm sure that you know this as well. Right. Once you've acquired a certain amount of wealth. Right. It changes the way you think. Right. It's like, you know, that 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 comfy hotel room that now you that you could afford that starts to become normalized in your brain. Right. So I was already normalized to heights that were not normal. It was not normal. So going backwards. Right. Was it was you lose your ego. 
right? You lose all sense of, you lose all the friends that you had because you can't relate to them anymore. I can't relate to my friend, my old friends anymore, right? They, they, they're trust fund kids. You know, I've, I've literally earned my wealth, right? And you know, like right. I literally clawed well, I, to get it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I challenge you on that a little bit. Um, um, so yours is a little bit different because you personally did not earn it the first time. You True. had it. Then you went to nothing, but then you were able to rebuild. Normally, if you built it the first time, and then like, if, for example, if your dad did not disappear, he was smart enough to build it the first time, you can do it again. It's actually easier because you have the experience. It'll be once you get through that mental challenge and if you, you know, don't quit, you can't. I think it's a lot easier. Like, for example, if I lost everything right now, I can go into a whole new industry and I can rebuild because I have the experience of doing it once. But but I but here's the thing, Tone. Like I had no experience, right? right. Like I you was, had no experience, right? In your personal case, is a little bit different. But uh, but for people that did build it the first time, it is very easy for them. This is why you you see a lot of people like after they go, they build, they go bankrupt, they build, they go bankrupt, they build, they go bankrupt. Because yeah, like, I, I, once I, you've I, done I, it once, it's I, easy I, to do it again. I, I think that the the but the, the average... first time is very hard. Yeah, that the first hunt getting to the first hundred K, I think, yeah. is the, the most difficult thing that you could do. I completely agree with you. Um, and then everything after that gets significantly easier. But um, so, yeah, man, th th this concept, right, Tone, um, that look, you were prepared, right? You, you, you told you talked to me about essentially your battle plan, man, you, you went from teaching, right? And then you right. became you, you worked at Wall Street to, you know, you tried to, you know, venture out, try to start your own companies, you worked at Wall Street, when I'm listening to all that, what I'm listening to is experience, man. And experience is priceless. That's what literally gets you up, right? That's your teacher. And that's exactly what you said. If you lost it all tomorrow, you need you know the right moves that you would have to take in order to succeed in the new venture that you had i didn't have anything right because i always had that expectation in yeah. the back of my mind tone i was like ah, i don't have to do anything my old friends are all like that by the way right i don't have to do anything i it's it just i just have to do the minimal graduate from college then my dad's gonna give me a job in his company and you know everything's just gonna work out and i have to do minimal effort all of that, you know, it was, I was, I was 17 years old, right? Was just pulled out right under me. And then all of a sudden the friends that I used to go out with, I can no longer afford to go out with them anymore. Yep. I can no longer afford to do any of those things anymore. So again, you know, I went through some very dark times, but luckily like you, you know, you found it through, you know, your, your political views, finding Ron Paul, etc. right? I literally had a cousin come to me from Venezuela and then he came to me and I was living at my friend's apartment at the time. And he's like, have you heard of, have you heard of Bitcoin mining? There are these machines that make money. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I was like, tell me everything, you know, you know, and then that's at that moment in time tone. I was like, okay, listen, out of desperation, I'm not going to take, you know, the, the, I'm not going to have, you know, the audacity to say, oh, it was the libertarian thing. It was that I was at such a low point in my life that I was grasping at anything at that time yeah. to get out. And then, you know, when he said, you know, magic internet money, you know, printing machines, this was, you know, a uh, very early 2016, I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, you know? So then I took my my chance, right? But Tony, yeah, I, I wanna- uh, my, yeah. my, my, my was, Mine was the opposite, right? I Googled Bitcoin, I heard about it in 2011, I Googled it in 2012. When I Googled it in 2012, all I found was mining. but in 2012, I was like so busy with my career coming off the financial crisis because I almost lost my job then. And um, I was like with a new company now and I was so busy with my career, I looked at mining and I'm like, this is crazy. I don't have time for this. Uh, this is too complicated. And I ignored Bitcoin because all I found was mining. But in 2013, when I started Googling, now I found, oh, you can just buy it. Like I didn't realize you can just buy Bitcoin in 2012. And, uh, but in 2013, I saw that you can just buy it. But uh, real quick to finish up that last thought, 
Um, so I didn't even get to travel and see anything outside of US and Canada until the age of like 27, right? So I'm close to your age. I've never seen any of the world. And um, I wanted to, and I, then I, I saw one of my first vacation, uh, it was, I think my first vacation was to Trinidad for carnival because I had a Trinidadian coworker. And I'm like, wow, this is a lot of fun. And then the following year, I went with a girl to the Philippines. That's where her family was. And I'm like, wow, Asia is incredible. And uh, so this was like 2010, 2011, like around that time. And that's when I started, you know what? I want to see a little bit of the world. So when I quit to be a trader and do this, uh, it turns out that being a trader gets you stuck at home in a basement, but doing the Bitcoin stuff, the public speaking, which I always love because I, so I started out as a teacher. I'm a good educator and I love public speaking. It was, I even took the classes in college and I really enjoyed it while everyone else is like scared to be on stage. The public speaking, the educating about Bitcoin was just more enjoyable, but that is something that costs me money. They don't pay me. I'm not Andreas Antonopoulos. They don't pay me to, you know, travel and go on stage. It costs me money to do it. I don't pay the conference to speak. Uh, sponsors do that, but I usually have to pay my own way to get there. So that costs me to teach people about Bitcoin. So I was financing that with trading, but now just like working Wall Street and trading is hard to concentrate. Traveling and public speaking and educating about Bitcoin and running the YouTube channel and being interviewed um, makes it hard to concentrate on trading. So I financed my uh, Bitcoin evangelism and fighting, you know, guys like Roger Veer eventually, who used to be a friend of mine, uh, with teaching others how to trade. And uh, because I'm a good teacher and I have good experience trading and I was a profitable trader. And uh, people like learning from me. And that was my perfect combination of, you know, quitting and enjoying life without an office while still, you know, satisfying all my passion, passion for travel, passion to educate and keeping, you know, involved, keeping myself involved in the markets. That's that, that's my story. Man, fascinating story. And, you know, um, I, one of my favorite books, and I think that it's a must read, you know, when you're getting deep down the, the rabbit hole is the sovereign individual. And you are, my friend, a sovereign individual. You know, you are, you know, moving place to place, you know, you're, 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 you're taking all the equipment that you need, you know, and, and the most important thing, and this is one of the things that I, I, I see about wealth, right? I, I don't define wealth as, of course, you know, it's, it's obviously the amount of Bitcoin you have and all that, but you put that aside, right? I think the, the thing that defines wealth for me is, are you able to do whatever the F you want with your time, right? Um, that's the big, you know, that's the big, uh, that's the big question, right? And, and it looks like, you know, that's exactly what you're doing. You know, I've been fortunate enough to... Um, to uh, you know, go full time Bitcoin again. You know, uh, 2018 was brutal for me, um, but you know, uh, towards the end of 2018, 2019, you know, I've been able, been fortunate enough to go full time as well, and not have to be at an office. You know, and uh, I'm a little bit different than you, Tone. You know, I'm more of a homebody, but uh, you know, I I. I literally focus on making content every day, you know, and I mine a little bit and I have a couple, you know, fiat businesses on the side, traditional brick and mortar stuff. Right. But the point is, right, is that, you know, you know how it is, Tone, when you're your own boss, right? Uh, if you don't do your stuff, no one else is going to do it. Right. So you don't have a nine to five per se. Right. But the luxury of it is is that, you know, you can wake up or you can travel wherever you want. Right. And that's incredibly liberating and i think that is worth more than you know making uh to use your example two hundred thousand dollars a year but at the same time you know uh metaphorically you're chained to a desk right so i think that i think that you that you've really uh encompassed that tone you know i think that i think that a lot of people see what you're doing you know um on your youtube 
and and they're like, man, this guy's in a different location everywhere he goes. And then on top of that, you have the amazing thumbnails, which I'm a huge fan of, by the way, of you like with the Lambo in the background. And then when when the price goes down, it's like on fire. And then when the price is everything's OK, there's a Lamborghini in the backyard. So, yeah, man, I, I think that I, I think that's what life is about. You know, it's not necessarily having, you know, the huge mansion on the beach, right? Even though you're working for, you know, someone the entire time, right? You know, I would much rather be, you know, a tone vase, right? That uh, literally goes wherever he wants, right? And he takes his whole life with him, which is- Yeah, it makes, it, makes a it a lot individual. harder with these COVID restrictions to, uh, I mean, it's uh, very frustrating. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but it feels like, uh the pol the the god class is on a mission to prevent people like us from having the freedom to move around the world well yeah so covid was a very convenient way you know for uh them to implement you know uh you know this digital id system that that's what they want to do eventually where you know you can't leave 15 miles away from your house Right. Uh, it's 2030. Uh, you'll you'll be happy. You'll you'll own nothing. You'll you'll be happy, you know, with the, the party of Davos, you know, uh, right. the World Economic Forum guys. So, yeah. In, in tone, like you have to understand that, like you, your parents came from the Soviet Union. Right. I came from Venezuela. So I saw one of the wealthiest countries in Latin oh, yeah. America. Yeah. You get, were the third. You were the third wealthiest country in North America behind U.S. and Canada. And, and it, it was, was gutted. Okay. It was it U.S., was, Canada, and then Venezuela. It was gutted because of socialism. So when when I see just a le little glimpse and taste, right, um, I'm I'm I react aggressively and maniacally, and I'm like, no, that's communism. Nothing is for free. There's an old Soviet joke, right? There's no such thing as free cheese, right? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and yeah. Like, you, you see you see it recently. It's like the mouse gets killed because he doesn't understand why the cheese is free. There you go. There, there we go. So, you know, it's very easy for people like us, right? The only people that, that like communism are people that have not experienced communism. Because you talk oh, yeah. to anyone from an ex-Soviet country, right, you know, Eastern Europe, or you talk from someone from Cuba, you talk to someone from Venezuela, and you mention all these things and, they're, and they, 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 they see America as, as freedom, right? Like, oh, this country is about freedom. And unfortunately, lately, you know, and this is what socialists do. They promise you all this free crap and they, they never give it to you. Um, they just did. The funniest thing was the AOC dress. She has the audacity to wear tax the rich at a thirty thousand dollar per ticket event. You know, it's like, who the hell are you kidding? But that's how social that's how socialists are. Right. They enrich themselves and the majority of the population live like serfs. Right. So. Tone, it, you know, and, and I know that you've been very vocal about this and I, we, we've both lost many Twitter followers, um, you oh, yeah. know, being vocal about this stuff. Um, what is your outlook on, you know, the, the, the future of the United States? Because the way that I see it, man, is now that they figured out how to, you know, use the whole mail in system to, you know, to put it lightly, finesse you know, the system to try to get it to their way. And then they have the backing of, you know, the mainstream media, right? Um, where do you see the future of the US? You know, did, did, I, I, like I, I tend to be, you know, optimistic as hell because I am living on a Bitcoin standard, right? But uh, but I would love to get your perspective. Let, let's, uh, man, we wish we did this interview in a couple of days when the results of Governor Newsom in California uh, the recall election. They're going to steal uh, that, man. <laughs> would be no. Well, here's the thing, right? Uh, that election is going to say a lot because when I was in Washington, D.C. on the 6th, that people still, you know, call me a traitor for. Meanwhile, it was the proudest day of me being an American. That was the first time I've ever attended any protest whatsoever was on January 6th uh, in Washington me and about 2 million other Americans, and it should have been a lot more. Uh, but uh, that election is going to say a lot because if Newsom remains the governor of California, it basically tells me that there is n like absolutely like no, like blatant, 
Like it's blatant. Uh, they don't care. And then there's only one thing left, watching who's going to be elected president in 2024. Because one of the biggest problems with the 2010 election, I remember uh, a friend of mine, she's, she's a little bit older than me, and uh, she just sent me this email the day after the election. And her email kind of just went like this. He's like, Tone, I don't know what to do about my future in America because this election did not properly inform me on how many communists are actually living around me. And that really resonated with if Biden actually, if I felt that Biden was elected honestly, I would be more scared for America as to the amount of people that are communists around me. But if the election was stolen and Trump was, and going into that election, I had expected Trump to have the highest re-election percentage in American history uh, for a sitting president. And if those seven states did not, when I went to sleep, he was up in all of the seven swing states. And when I woke up in the morning, he lost all seven of those states, which was it, insane. It was fascinating. I went to bed at, and I went to bed at like two in the morning. It, it, it was fascinating, Tone, because they they stopped the, they stopped the count yeah. consecutively, all yeah. at the same time. And I remember, Tone, that I got messages from very predominant Bitcoiners that day, very similar to that email that you received from your friend, and, and, and these are very you guys all you guys know these people by name. I just don't want to mention who they are specifically. And man, it's like, are you seeing what's going on right now? And I was getting chills, right? Because what it reminded me of was Venezuela. I was seeing right. Venezuela, right? right? I was seeing the states being frozen, saying, oh, we're going to stop the count. And then I saw Biden for the first time in American history. People don't remember this, right? going out there and essentially announcing his victory without the other the opposition candidate conceding that's never happened before why was it that the seven states in question that he needed to win all stopped counting at the same time again you're not allowed to ask these questions right oh, and then, I mean, like we again we can we can have a whole episode i think we <laughs> did do a whole episode on uh, the election and the insanity i did that with jimmy song and stuff but, but the point is that uh, that election, we, I, I, I may stick around for one more election. And there are a couple of candidates that I would love to see president of the United States. Um, and that's Christian uh, uh, Nome from South Carolina. We have Ron DeSantis down in Florida. Uh, maybe a couple of guys from Texas. Unfortunately, Ron Paul is too old, but his son Rand Paul uh is okay and that's a very very short list i'm not sure if i want trump back uh even though i think that trump is the best possible candidate for president out of every lifetime politician i just think that trump coming back would create a bigger divide but i yeah. will certainly vote for him once again uh, I have no, you know, I'm not even shy about saying that. Um, but most likely, uh, we're not going to get the right president in. And I foresee a split of the United States before 2030. <clears throat> Going into the, the end of this decade, I foresee the split of the United States into multiple countries, uh, anywhere from two to four countries. And it's going to be interesting. It's going to happen at the same time as the collapse of the dollar. Because the only thing that is keeping this country together is a strong dollar. Because with a strong dollar, you can pay the enforcement officers. These are your IRS. This is your FBI. This is your uh, local police is a little bit different. This is your military. And if that dollar collapses, there is absolutely no ability to enforce 
especially with the amount of guns the United States has. Unlike Venezuela, uh, Biden has not yet taken away the guns like Chavez did. So uh, you will not, uh, the U.S. dollar will, the, the U.S. government, the federal government will not be able to enforce the, uh, the United States staying together. And I think it will break up. And people think that borders never change. Borders change all the time. Borders are changing every day. Russia is encroaching on Ukraine. Russia is encroaching on the Republic of Georgia. Uh, by the way, two of my top five favorite countries in the world. Uh, so I'm very disappointed in that. Um, China is going to take over a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens with Venezuela. Uh, other countries merge. Other countries split. Um, Yugoslavia, you know, completely broke up, uh, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, it happens all the time. Uh, and the U S history is solid. Uh, the U S has been a single country the, the Europe is trying to merge. The United States is having this divide. You're witnessing the divide in the United States accelerate almost on a daily basis. And the mainstream media is just throwing, like, I don't even say logs. They're throwing, like, redwood trees on this fire. And um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to implode. It's going to implode. The question is, will it be violent or won't it be violent? I personally don't like violence. I'm hoping it will be peaceful and um, I'm kind of hoping I am still an American if that split happens, because I want to be on the right side of that split. Uh, so and the right side of that split would be states like Florida, Texas, and most of the states in between those two uh, and the Midwest. And uh, I've went to St. Louis lately, Missouri. Wow, that is true Trump country. I got to say that like per capita. Uh, Missouri is probably has the most Trump supporters, which was fascinating to see. Uh, Trump 2024 hats, flags everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> you put one of those things up in New York or California, you're going to get like, like you're going to get a mob at your house. And, 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 and it's fascinating tone because it's you go to New York and California, you know, and I've spent so many, I spent so much time in New York. And you just see the the insanity, right? Like building little shacks outside so that you could eat outside because apparently if you eat outside, there's no COVID, right? And then you contrast that with Florida, right? I, dude, I walk into supermarkets all the time without a mask. No one says anything. I go to restaurants. Everyone's yeah. happy. Everyone's having a good time. And New York, it's like everyone's. It's like you can't, after midnight, the city is 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 dead. And I've never seen that in New York before. And yeah. it, and it's like these. Why do you think that is tone where these people are voting for their own demise? That that's just the reality of it. And that's the first part of the question. The second part the of the question is the educational system. It, the, educational the educational system, system is. So bad. All of like 98% of teachers are complete liberal uh, and they get, you know, money from unions, which are basically like uh, gangs uh, that do nothing but make money from bribes uh, from their own people, from the government, uh, their government jobs, fuel more government jobs, more bureaucracy. It's the educational system, man. It's um, uh, something really needs to change. Uh, and no, and I, I completely agree with you. I think that the educational system is 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 fundamentally broken. The public schools, it's like uh, indoctrination camps. Really, that's really what they are. Um, but Tone, I have a question for you. What? Why do you think they had the audacity to? steal at the level they did because that's never happened in american history before they really 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 went far this time in fact i think that they went a little bit too far it right? was trump um, it was it was trump it was 
the American people electing a non-politician to a position of power is probably the scariest thing for a politician than anything else. They can, uh, this is why Trump is better than a DeSantis. This is why he's better than, you know, any other life. Well, DeSantis is not a lifelong politician. At least DeSantis was in the military, you know, which again is a hit or miss, but at least with the military, you have a 50-50 shot on being normal versus, you know, a, a, an insane bureaucrat. Uh, with a lifelong politician whose former job was a lawyer, which is like 95% of all politicians, they're all freaking lawyers. At least Ron Paul and his son Rand Paul are doctors. Uh, but uh, uh, very few politicians have an actual career uh, as a business person, as a non, well, like 90% of all politicians only know one thing, how to make money from other people's money. Yeah. And they're, uh, the worst possible thing for them is a non-politician uh, above them. And once Trump was elected, it didn't matter. Like the laws, the constitution, the, uh, the, you know, the levels you can go to to eliminate Trump had no bounds because it was a fight for political survival. Because when Trump gets elected, I would say 90% of those politicians like went to bed that night thinking I might actually be arrested before my next re-election campaign. Unfortunately, Trump did not arrest any of the current sitting politicians. And that was his downfall. Uh, when Trump ran on a platform, I will drain the swamp. He didn't drain the swamp. And I know he had the means and the data on all, ma many of the illegal activities of many of the politicians. And there are three types of politicians that matter, right? There's governors, there's congressmen, and there are senators. House of Representatives, about 400 something, 50 senators, and uh, sorry, 100 senators, two from each state, and 50 governors. So you have a pool of about 700 people. What he had to do was out of that 700, all you got to do is arrest about a dozen of them. Arrest a dozen most corrupt. Most will be Democrat. A few will probably be Republican. You arrest them and you make an example of them. And at least 300 others will sing like a canary. And that would have made an actual difference. But he didn't do any of that. And it was a fight for their survival. And they took him out without any uh, consideration of any consequences. Because the one guy that could hold them criminally accountable has now been removed. Yeah. And it, it... no other lifelong politician will do this. Will, and this is why no other non-lifelong politician will ever be elected again to a serious position because they don't want to go to bed at night thinking they might be arrested for all of the bribes and the illegal activities that our current politicians are doing. Yeah, it, it, it's it, man, it, it's an incredible perspective. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I think Trump got, um, you know, I think it, 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 could, it, it took them completely off guard. Um, and, you know, we saw, I think for the first time in American history, this idea of the deep state, which was a conspiracy, you know, was exposed for all to see. Um, and yeah, I agree with you. I think that, that Trump, you know, and Trump being a businessman, I think that he lacked the tenacity, um, and the ferocity of these politicians and what they're willing, you know, to maintain that power. Right. And I think that he miscalculated yeah, he grossly, that. He grossly underestimated it. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's so true, man. But listen, 
let's tie bitcoin into all yeah of this, you know, i was right? just about to say the same thing i'm let's like hey, tie, we gotta tie bitcoin the, the, into let's this. tie bitcoin into all this because there's a there's a there's a method to my madness okay yeah because I, I wanted to talk about the bureaucracy and and the sovereign individual it explains this right how we're transitioning from the industrial age into the information age right and these governments right these these top-down governments in the united states has become essentially a welfare democracy right they're all only supported and these politicians included they're all only supported because of fiat because the money printer the money printer is what allows them to do the things that they wanted to do, whether that's getting, uh, you know, winning a popularity contest and deciding to invade another country and blowing it into oblivion, right? Essentially, well, you get elected and you get access to this unlimited money printer. Now, Bitcoin is a threat to that money printer. In, in, in my opinion, I think it's going to highlight, especially in El Salvador, it's going to highlight, right, the deficiencies of fiat money versus a money that can't be debased right um that there's only 21 million of right something that has absolute scarcity um do you believe right that bitcoin will change governments in the sense that it it will make governments more so instead of citizens being essentially serfs you know for for the federal government right it will change the balance of power where the government starts to become mostly like a service provider and the citizens are uh are customers right rather than serfs right or do you do you see a world into that i know that it's going to be very bumpy transitioning into that because like you said these crazy maniacal bureaucrats are not going to want to let go of the power of the money printer right but do you do you see that as in an inevitability or or not i don't see it as an inevitability yet um i am hopeful so it's a, I'm, I'm really bullish on Latin America. I'm uh, not bullish on much else of the world, uh, especially Australia or Canada, but I am very bullish on Latin America because I think by the end of this decade, almost every country in Latin America is going to have Bitcoin as legal tender throughout all of Latin America. And the amount of <clears throat> commerce that will be done between these nations is going to be incredible because it will just open up all of these business opportunities for trade. Uh, it'll be awesome. Now, Bitcoin has two independent purposes. And this is where when I do my presentations called Bitcoin value proposition, I talk about the three properties of Bitcoin. Uh, property number one is unconfiscatability. It allows you to earn wealth with an asset that will keep appreciating in value that no one else can confiscate. Property number two is uh, seamless commerce. This is your uh, sorry, censorship resistant value transfer between two places. And property number three is the inability to inflate Bitcoin. This is the hard money aspect. But there's two ways to use Bitcoin. There is a way to use Bitcoin as a sovereign individual uh, where you actually take advantage of the first two properties. And then there is a, a way to use Bitcoin through the government institutions. These are your coin bases. These are your government approved, these are your Bitcoin banks. So being your own bank is very scary and potentially financially dangerous and tricky. And a lot of people are not ready for it. And most people probably shouldn't even do it. So if the government is controlling your Bitcoin transactions, they have, I mean, they can't print the money. So they can't control you as much with socialism, but they can still kind of control you with uh, access to society. You know, this is your vaccine passport, right? You don't have the right papers, you can't get on this flight. You don't have the right papers, you can't eat. Well, we don't like your Bitcoin transactions, so you can't make them. But at least the government can't print the Bitcoin. So it is still an advantage. You know, we get halfway 
we get halfway to freedom with the government in control of your Bitcoin transaction. So this is the government that recognizes that Bitcoin is, a, is uh, inevitable. It's a government that realizes that um, we can be the world superpower. Why isn't North Korea a world superpower, but America is, right? North Korea has the most, uh, that's the government that has the, ma the most control over its people. And North Korea is not close to being the world superpower. America probably has the least control over its people uh, because of US gun laws and uh, probably the most freedom, uh, the most freedom accepting constitution uh, that the government doesn't really follow, but at least it's there. So America is the world superpower, not because uh, of its military. America is the world superpower because uh, our transparency is the most respected. Our it's freedom. It's the one country that still pulls in the maximum amount of smart immigrants that want to come here and build a new life. Once that ends, the U.S. superpower ends. Now, if Latin America or a single large country like a Brazil, like a Mexico, recognizes that they could be the most respected country in the world if they have the most honest and transparent political and financial systems with a freedom uh, objective rule of law that they can enforce because the country is rich enough to enforce a rule of law like the U.S., financial markets are still the, the best markets because they do have financial regulation that they can somewhat enforce better than any other country. Okay. So Latin America or even a country like India, you know, if they got rid of their bureaucracy and they opened up, you know, the 2 billion people in India uh, to freedom of Bitcoin, even uh, the, that India could be the you know the world the, the next global superpower. They're not going to be, but they have the chance. They have a small enough population. They have a large enough population. <clears throat> they have both manufacturing cent, uh, sector and um, you know uh, a uh, a service sector. So they can do it with the freedom of Bitcoin. I don't know if they're going to, but they can. But that's halfway there. And the other half is being sovereign over your own Bitcoin. And that is a much, much bigger challenge. We will see uh, if we can get all the way there. But anything is an improvement. Anything is an improvement. You know, the, uh, so I, I think you get the gist of where I'm going with this. No, absolutely. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that... Um... Bitcoin gives it it, it 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 at least provides an alternative, right? To essentially, you know, because of the place that you were born, you know, you're essentially stuck using that currency. And I think that Latin Americans, you know, I always say it's much easier to educate someone who has you know, whose, whose fiat currency experiences somewhat inflation, you know, an Argentinian, uh, a Brazilian, uh, someone from Venezuela, from Colombia, they understand Bitcoin like this, right? You speak to some, you try to, you know, educate someone about Bitcoin in the West, you know, and they're like, but I have Venmo, you know, that's, that's kind of the typical reaction. And I, and, and I think it's, 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 it's exactly what you said, man. I, I think that um, it provides at least a way out right at least um a way out of the the madness you know you see this in in venezuela right you, you have a couple predominant you know uh personalities on bitcoin twitter where you know th they're living as if nothing happened the country's collapsing and it's because you know they're living on the bitcoin standard man but um i completely agree with you i think a whole lot of things are going to happen within a uh, hundred years is going to happen within this decade um and let's see what happens in terms of, you know, the politics, the power, 
But guys, you know, I hope I gave you a, a different glimpse of Tone. Um, I know that you guys usually see Tone from a trading perspective. Um, I kind of wanted to break down who Tone is, you know, what, what makes up Tone, you know, why he's always traveling. Um, you know, so I, I kind of wanted to take a different approach. I hope some of you enjoyed that. Before we go, I always do, you know, literally uh, fire, fire point questions or... You know, very, very quick questions. And of course, because it is Tone Vase, right? Uh, first question is, Tone, what temperature do you like your steak? Oh, I'm a medium rare guy and a ribeye guy. So medium rare ribeye. Medium rare ribeye. Okay, okay. I'm a medium. You know, I'm not, I'm not as adventurous medium rare. But if it is very good quality steak, I will go with the medium rare. Okay, so uh, two more, two more bullet point questions. What do you think the price of Bitcoin will be at the end of 2021? At the end of this year, I think it will be approximately $100,000. Are we going above so a or bit, below? A little bit lower or a little bit higher with the trajectory to break it. Okay, okay. Bullish, that's bullish, bullish. That's your vicinity. 90, 90 to 110. That, 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 that's my range. Okay, so good, good, good range by Tone Vase. You heard it here. And last question, Tone. What do you think the price of Bitcoin is going to be at the end of the decade after all the craziness, after the end of the fourth turning, 2030? I, I don't think we would be measuring it in dollars. I think dollar would be done. Um, I don't think it would be measured in dollars. So the moon, more than the moon, Mars. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much awesome bullish all right guys that was our show but before we go i want to give oh, wait, a before shout you go can I, can I tell you a, yeah. fu uh, a funny uh argentina story absolutely love to hear it okay so i'm just trying to let me just, i just gotta do i was just trying to do like quick math real quick i'm trying to get the exchange rate of the argentinian peso uh to the u.s dollar i have my chart up let me, uh, on in November of 2016, so give me a second here. Uh, 2016, I'm sorry, December 2016. Here we go. Uh, the exchange rate was, it says 0 0.064, which seems a little bit too small. So let me see here. 80 pesos, so I think it was 80, uh, divide, uh, times, point zero oh it was eighty dollars okay that's what it was six four uh it was eighty dollars worth of pesos so it was uh a point zero six so eighty us dollars divided by point zero six four is looks like 1200 pesos okay so here we go I was at a Bitcoin conference in Argentina in 2016. I was leaving Argentina with 80 US dollars worth of pesos in my pocket. And I had two options. Uh, convert those $80 worth of pesos into dollars at the airport, or uh, which I was lazy and didn't do. But I was even lazier a few hours before that where I was surrounded by Bitcoiners and I could have converted that 80 US dollars worth of pesos into 0.2 Bitcoin. Oh my God, bro. Ah! Because it was 2016. Uh, dude. Okay. So today, and my logic was I really enjoyed Argentina and I'm going to be back very, very soon. And at least I'll have cash, local cash to take a taxi from the airport. I have not yet been back to Argentina. That $80 worth of pesos has lost close to 90% of its value. <laughs> so it is now approximately $10. But had I converted to Bitcoin, leaving a Bitcoin conference, point to Bitcoin today is $8,000. <laughs> And this is exactly why Bitcoin is going to kill fiat. Um, 
Man, uh, Toad, that's a brutal story. And I think that all of us, I, I call it the price of tuition, all of us have made this stupid freaking choice of, you know, just not stacking enough, not stacking hard enough, right? Um, but I feel like everyone has that problem. But anyways, wow. All right, guys, that was an incredible show. Uh, Tone, thank you for that amazing story. I want to give a shout out to Tone, guys. Uh, you definitely have to subscribe to his YouTube channel. He, you know, he goes after, he does Bitcoin TA. And I like his TA. And 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 one of the things, right, he was right about, um, I, I pay attention to these things. Um, I've been following Tone for quite a while. In 2020, right, he was right about the dump. I think we pumped all the way to 14K. And then he was expecting it to go down. And I know he got a lot of stuff for that. He was right on that call. And again, he was also right on the call um, about, you know, the, 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 the drop during this bull cycle, right? Which was in January, I remember him saying this. Yeah, we're going to pump to 64, 60, and then we're going to drop, you know. Um, and I remember him saying that. And that was in January. And that's exactly what he did, right? So, you know, uh, can't be a coincidence. He's, he's getting some things right. And again, you know, that's because he's been doing this for many years and, you know, experience. You can't replace and I'm, experience. And I'm of, bullish now, so make sure you buy the F and dip. Uh, buy the F and dip. Tone Vase is <laughs> bullish. You heard that. So definitely go subscribe to Tone Vase. And I also want to give a shout out to his other projects, right? You go check out the Crypto Scam Podcast. And I'm sure you're bashing on shit coins. Remember, guys, yeah, shit I coins. I haven't done that one in a while. There's still a playlist on my YouTube channel for the old uh, Crypto Scam episodes. They apply to all the new shit coins as well. And the conferences, Unconfiscatable, taking place in the U.S., understanding bitcoin where we teach people how to set up wallets how to actually use bitcoin uh that's going to take place in dubai this october uh 14 to 15 and also the financial summit this is uh for the high net worth individual the successful trader the fund manager it's called you can just google the words financial summit the next one coming up in dubai uh in november that's a week-long uh very exclusive event only for 40 people awesome 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 i'm definitely be at the unconfiscatable event um the tone was telling me about it we met up in person miami very excited and uh i lost some money in poker but it was worth it because i got to hang out with a lot of bitcoin hey you brought some awesome tequila man that was uh <laughs> one of the better tequilas i've had i've never had that one before uh good job man i, I can't wait to hang out again Likewise, man. It's it's you know it, it, it's it's that we it, it, being raised in Miami. You know one of the things that you do if you get invited to someone's house, you bring a good bottle. That's what that's like basic you know uh, stuff that we do down here. But Tone, it's been a pleasure, guys. That was another episode of the Bit Bit Vault podcast, a podcast for Bitcoin plebs. And of course, I only bring Bitcoiners on here and Bitcoiners from all walks of life, whether that's a miner, whether that's a trader like Tone, an educator, whether that is a coder, right? I try to bring every single Bitcoiner and I like to hear their stories, right? Because I think we all find the common truth, the same truth, but we take many different types of journeys to get there, right? And now you've heard Tone, Tone's journey and that was super awesome. All right, guys, I'll see you on the next one.